All right. Up next, we've got Jim and Dan from Tanium. They are going to be a little bit of uh, talking about what's going on in the world today. And uh, without further ado, here they are. I think you guys are all set up. You're ready to roll. Uh, they said they're probably not going to take the whole time, and they're willing to take questions after. So enjoy. Thank you. Appreciate it. So hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Uh, let me just. Ah, awesome. My name is Jim Wojno. I'm a technical account manager with Tanium. And my name is Dan Keita. I'm also a technical account manager with Tanium out of the Cleveland area. So um, we want to make sure that you understand we're not, this is not a sales pitch. We're not here to talk about Tanium's products. We just basically want to tell you who we are and a little bit about our background just to sort of give you a level set of you know, why we care about this, what we see in our interactions, and some ideas that we have to hopefully improve the way that we address some fundamental issues in info, InfoSec. So, you know, what we see really as defenders, we consider ourselves blue team members, um, there's, there's a propensity in the industry to kind of focus on the shiny object. And we're going to talk about that in detail. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about how a return to a back to basics security hygiene focused approach can actually pay a higher dividend to our efforts as defenders and then also to the businesses that we support. And we're going to go into uh, some details on, on some concrete steps and examples of things that you as defenders can use in that role. So if we sort of level set uh, what defenders are facing today, um, none of this should be a surprise to anybody in this room. Uh, in preparing for this particular talk, if you look at that slide or the um, screenshot on the left-hand side there, um, it might be a little bit hard to read. Do you have Zoom it on here? Yes. Awesome. And, and, well, I apologize. Um, what's the, the hot key for? Ah, awesome. Oh, it's not really working. Okay, well, <laughs> our apologies for that. So, oh, and I don't know what I did there. So, I'm sorry. It's not my laptop. So, uh, can you get rid of the? Just kind of move there. Yeah, I don't know. All right, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. So I'll tell you what's up here. So it's a little bit hard to see. But on, on the left-hand side there, you see that in preparing for this, I went out to TechNet, and I looked at just the security updates for this year. So starting January 1st of this year, and the date up there is uh, October 12th. That was the date that I put this slide together. Um, there were roughly just under 600 security updates for Microsoft. That's one platform, you know, one, one vendor that you guys are working with in your organizations. If you look on the right-hand side, this one's a little bit more interesting from my perspective. Um, these are the CVEs that were released just for the Windows platform in that same time period. And these are just the CVEs that have a CVSS score of eight or above. So we're talking about the critical releases. And there were 118 of them as of, again, October the 12th. That was a couple of weeks ago. So my guess is that number is actually a little bit higher. If you look at the type of attacks that are leveraging those vulnerabilities and those exploits, you know, the numbers are really, really high. And again, none of this is really a surprise to anybody in this room. I'm really just kind of trying to lay a baseline here. Uh, but you can see that, that uh, this was from uh, McAfee's threat report, not because I have a particular affinity for them, but I do think they have a good threat report. That's why I chose that as a source. But you can see it's over 50 million samples in Q2 of 2017. And those are new samples. Those are new, unique samples. Those are not duplicates. So the real numbers of what these companies are dealing with and what you as defenders are dealing with are actually much, much higher than that. Um, ransomware, again, off from its peak in 2016, but still on an upward trajectory. And so, you know, these are all things that we deal with as defenders. And again, I think that as an industry, we have this tendency to kind of look for silver bullets and shiny objects to help us deal with this ever-rising flood of attacks and exploits. And, and in reality, if we look at a couple of case studies, as we're going to do, we'll see that actually taking a security hygiene focused approach actually pays a higher dividend for that. One of the things that's sort of endemic of this, uh, uh, this, this hype that's in the industry 
uh, this shiny object syndrome, if you want to call it that, is almost this celebrity status that, that vulnerabilities have attained. And this is very, very different from how things were when I started in this field. Vulnerabilities used to be these really dry academic white paper type, you know, releases that, to be perfectly honest, very few people really truly understood. They may understand the impact, they may understand how to fix it, but to truly understand the vulnerability, it was actually a very small circle of people, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, but starting with Ghost and then followed up with Heartbleed, Shellshock, there's a whole long list of them. Again, these, these vulnerabilities almost became like celebrities. They have, they have uh, uh, their own logo. Uh, you expect that some of these vulnerability authors or, or some of the people who write the papers for this, maybe they're submitting you know, business plans and getting VC investment for their, for their vulnerability. It, it's kind of crazy. Uh, and even since this slide was created, you know, there's actually now bad rabbit and the duck attack. So there's, it's like this constant thing. And, and again, it's this sort of that shiny object syndrome, if you will, of focusing on this really interesting hype, uh, around this. But, but these are real vulnerabilities. These are real things that can cause real harm. Um, and I think that having that focus potentially, uh, on the flashiness of it or the, 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 the press around it, kind of loses some focus on that. Um, if we look at, in, in this particular case, we're going to talk in, in detail about the Shadow Brokers release and the impact that that had on society, right, um, in the form of WannaCry. So WannaCry, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, you know, the, the, the gentleman that was just speaking here before we came up uh, was talking about ransomware, and this that was an offshoot of this particular um, uh, uh, malware and this used that eternal blue exploit as a part of the shadow brokers release uh, in as its propagation method it was followed up very quickly by Petya and then not Petya or Netya I've heard it called a couple of different names uh, and again I'm sure that uh, even if you didn't deal with this in your organization you're familiar with the headlines and the issues that were surrounding the the problems that were surrounding this particular uh, suite of ransomware. And what's really frustrating from a, a defender standpoint uh, is the fact that if we look at the timeline, much of the impact of this really didn't need to happen. All right, much of the impact of this really did not need to happen the way that it did. If we look at the timeline, we, we look at how this unfolded, Microsoft had advanced notice of the Shadow Brokers tools that were going to be dropped. Um, they actually worked to release patches preemptively for that, uh, and they did release those patches in March of 2017, on March 14th of 2017. And there's two patches in particular as it pertains to this talk, but, um, you know, MS-17-010 is the big uh, granddaddy of this particular one. Um, but the fix was out there. The fix was available, and it was freely available to anybody. And about a month later, in fact, exactly a month later, the Shadow Brokers tools were dumped, and it contained detailed exploit code for anybody who wanted to exploit these particular exploits, right? Um, there were, I'm sure, probably people in this room, you have some of those PDFs that were uh, uh, circulating around exactly how to use um, Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar to take over a system. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a piece of cake. It, it was something that a 10-year-old could do. Um, and so it was not very difficult necessarily to leverage these particular vulnerabilities. WannaCry hit about a month after the Shadow Brokers tools released. Uh, and it leveraged that Eternal Blue SMB exploit as its primary propagation method. Uh, Petya followed about a month after that, a little more than a month after that. And then immediately after that was Netya, right, or not Petya. Um, but for those shops that actually had a robust security hygiene program, these were largely non-events. For those shops that did not have that security hygiene approach, these things were devastating. I read reports where there were organizations with 10, 15, 20,000 endpoints that were compromised by this in a matter of minutes, in a matter of minutes. And, and just think of how crippling that is to the enterprise, to your ability, not just to, to, to keep systems up and running, but to actually function as a business. I mean, you know, we're going to, I have another slide that talks about the societal impact, but it's, it's immense. Uh, and all of this was potentially avoidable. 
All of this, was, the, the fix for this was out there. Uh, and yet this was this crippling attack, this crippling wave of attacks that hit. Uh, in preparing for this particular talk, I did a quick Shodan search, and it's maybe a little bit difficult to see there what the, the search criteria was, but I looked for any Windows systems that had port 445 open and that had a banner of SMB1. And this is as of about 10 days ago, and it was over a million hits. Now, is it possible that some of those systems have, you know, the, the patches applied to it and they just have a disabled SMB1? Yes, it's possible. But I, but I would be willing to bet a sizable sum of money that at least half of those systems are probably vulnerable to this. And they're still out there. So it's just waiting for that next wave of these attacks to hit. If we look at, again, at the societal impact of the release of those tools and what that wave of ransomware has done, I mean, it's affected every facet of our lives. You look at hospitals, police stations, um, transportation systems. I mean, that's real impact in the kinetic world. This is not just some theoretical thing. This is not, uh, you know, just something that, that, that's going to cause some temporary harm to a small number of individuals. This potentially affects society. And, and you know, again, the conditions are ripe for this to happen again. If we look at another real world, you know, scenario, the, the Apache struts vulnerability. So it was released and announced at about the same time that the, uh, the patches were released by Microsoft. It was in March of 2017. There was a, a patch that was released at the time that this was announced. Uh, and within days, there was exploit code that was available for Metasploit. So anybody who had Metasploit could exploit this uh, and, and do so remotely and with devastating consequences. Um, Equifax was breached between May and July. Uh, they haven't released an actual date. Uh, so between two and four months after this patch was available, they were breached by this particular vulnerability. And by the way, I only mention them because they're in the press, and this is in no way, shape, or form an attempt to in any way uh, denigrate them, their company, or their efforts. I think that they probably are uh, endemic of a lot of shops that are out there, probably far too many shops that are out there. Uh, to be perfectly honest. So I don't think they're an outlier, but you know they, they're, they're a great case study and that's the only reason that I use them because they were in the press. Um, you can see that there was a follow-up release of another vulnerability in September, with, also followed up with a patch, and then immediately after that, uh, there, the, the breach was publicly announced. If we look at the actual vulnerability details itself, and this may be difficult to see, I apologize for that, but this is the um, uh, CVE 2017-5638. This was the original vulnerability. I mean, this is like the Sigourney Weaver alien of vulnerabilities. This thing is as is, is close to a per perfect vulnerability as you're ever going to see. It certainly is as much as I've ever seen. CVSS score of 10. Confidentiality impact complete. There is a total information disclosure. That's, it's written right there in the report. Integrity impact, complete. There is a total compromise of system integrity. Availability impact, complete. Uh, uh, access complexity, very little knowledge or skill is required to exploit. Authentication, not required. I mean, this is like the granddaddy super vulnerability, right? And yet, for, for months, uh, at least one high-profile shop that we know of, and I'm sure many others, failed to patch this vulnerability. Uh, and it led to the, the biggest data breach that we know of, at least right now. Uh, I think that it's a safe bet that there will be other data breaches that follow that will probably eclipse this, right? Uh, but at least right now, it's the largest one to date. And, and it was all completely avoidable. You know, it was all completely avoidable. With the right focus in the right areas, this was avoidable. If we look at the impact, again, almost half of the population in the United States was affected. I was affected. I'm sure I, I, you were, Dan was affected. Probably a good portion of the people in this room were, were affected. The final numbers for this particular uh, breach based on this vulnerability, uh, I don't know that it'll, it'll ever be known. And the long-term impact has yet to play itself out. So we don't know what that's going to look like. 
uh, the, the cost, the direct cost to that one business were estimated somewhere between 300 and 325 million dollars. So, you know, when you look at those costs and you think about how little it would have cost to have a robust program focused on security hygiene uh, in place to avoid this, I mean, you literally pennies on the dollar, fractions of pennies on the dollar. Um, loss of brand reputation, if you look at their stock ticker, it looks like it fell off a cliff, right? And now they have recovered some. To their credit, I think that they are trying to respond as best as they can. And I do think that there's a lesson there from this as well as some other high profile breaches that have occurred that really the recovery in how a, co a, 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 um, a company handles that, how an organization handles that, because it isn't always a private company, how an organization handles that really is going to be the tail of the tape of how or if they recover from it. And I actually think that they're doing some good things here. Uh, but the, the impact of this is devastating and it was completely avoidable. So with the backdrop of that, you know, again, we as defenders, we talk to a lot of vendors. We work for a vendor, okay? So full disclosure, right? Um, I, I got all these from actual security vendors' websites. These are screenshots. I purposely left their, their logos out because I'm not here to vendor shame. I just really want to kind of point out that, again, this is sort of that shiny object-ish syndrome that we seem to suffer from in, in info security. Um, unmatched protection against malware-based attacks, uh, you know, the end-to-end the -end security operations platform, best detection and accuracy ever in protecting against advanced persistent threats. So there's a lot of these lofty claims that are being made by a lot of vendors. And honestly, I think that in many cases, they actually do have some really good products. But if, if you're looking at it just from a standpoint that we need a silver bullet, the silver bullet's not going to work, all right? So if only we had the screaming goat APT detection system in our system, in, in our network, well, it's just going to knock out that malware like Batman and Robin, right? Biff, pow, socko. And the reality is that's just not reality, all right? Uh, there is a time and a place for some of these uh, that's really distracting, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> there is a time and a place for some of these products, but it has to be part of an overall, um, again, hygiene-focused approach. And this, this, this shiny object syndrome, uh, Dan and I are referring to this as the Kardashian effect, all right? The Kardashian effect that's been applied to info security. And if you look on uh, Urban Dictionary, uh, the Kardashian effect is uh, when someone or something becomes famous despite or because of a lack of skill, talent, or ability, right? And I think that you can apply that to what we see in some of the hype in the InfoSec security uh, world where uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, again, there's a lot of claims being tossed around, I think largely by a lot of people who don't truly understand the problem. And what we really need, in, in our opinion, what we really need, and I think is, is something that a lot of organizations are starting to put their arms around, is more of a return to basics. So for that, you know, we actually like Malcolm Gladwell in terms of more of a uh, role model for our industry, more of something to aspire to. So if you know anything about Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a book called Outliers, and in it he talks about how it takes hard work, right? It takes hard work to get things accomplished. You're not going to become an expert overnight. In his uh, theory, it takes 10,000 hours to be good at something. It's 20 hours a week for 10 years. And that's not to say that if you start today, it's going to take 10 years to clean up the mess that you probably inherited wherever it is that you work. Um, that, that's just a completely depressing thought. But the, the idea here is that you know, we really need to get away from this, this, this silver bullet, this shiny object mentality and get back to the hard work of actually performing the, the, the basics. You know, if you have the basics down and, you've, and you're very robust in those basics, then by all means, if there's a capability to add on to that with a silver bullet or something that, that claims to be a silver bullet, then you know what, that might actually be a good approach. But, but from a standpoint of being able to return value to the business, being able to 
actually that bang for the buck, you're going to get way more of it from a security hygiene approach. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to my colleague, Dan. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to, to talk with you guys today. I was a little disappointed when we put this together. Uh, so, so Jim got to talk about Kim Kardashian, all these fancy breaches, and I get the too long, slow, dull, tiresome, monotonous, and hopefully it's not a very uh, tedious journey here. But um, what I do want to talk about is what, what Jim had mentioned, you know, kind of this back to the basics approach. You know, so how do we build a, a security hygiene uh, capability within our, within our, within our organization? and make sure we're addressing patching, we're, we're addressing vulnerabilities, um, we're building things in a way that um, potentially we, we won't have the, the same breaches or opportunities for breaches in our organizations. Um, typically when we're doing that, when we're, we're building out a security capability in an organization, we typically look to, to frameworks. Um, and there's a lot of them out there uh, that you could leverage. So this is the NIST cybersecurity framework, you know, COBIT, I'm sure you're, all of you guys are familiar with these, uh, the CIS controls as well as just a, a whole host of a myriad of products and solutions and, you know, vendors beating down your door, you know, government uh, or you have compliance requirements, maybe that's PCI, maybe that's HIPAA. And all this could really be overwhelming if you're sitting in that seat and you, you're responsible for, you know, kind of pushing forward a security uh, capability within an organization. And I, I think, uh, um, Actually, yeah, I, I think that this was coined in the past by CIS is the, is the fog of more, right? So we, we just have all this overwhelming information that's available to us, and it could be difficult to understand what are we going to prioritize? You know, what should we really focus on first? What is really going to make it harder and more difficult for an attacker to be successful in their environment, right? And that really should be our focus as we, as we uh, build out our capabilities. And what we're going to talk about today is the, and I'm sure many of you may be familiar with them, are, are the CIS controls. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of background on these, um, they originally were called the SANS uh, critical, top 20 critical controls. Uh, these originated within the NSA uh, back in 2008, and they were uh, built as a way to help the DOD prioritize their security controls. Uh, they were based on uh, some of the methods that the NSA had found to be the most effective for preventing some of the attacks that they were doing as a red team against you know, both government and uh, critical infrastructure. And they found that these uh, basic controls uh, really could potentially you know, prevent a lot of the things that they were trying to do. Uh, you can see that you know, there's a, a number one to 20. I know it may be a little bit hard to see, um, but really what I want to point out here is these are a prioritized group of controls. You know, so really you should start on, on number one uh, the inventory uh, uh, authorized and unauthorized devices, right? That's going to be a foundational control that a lot of others are going to be built on. And you could start working your way down. You can see I have the first five that are, are bolded here. These are the ones that we're going to focus on in a little more detail today. I definitely encourage you to go out to the CIS website. Uh, we have it, uh, a link on the bottom there. You know, if you guys want to dive in a little bit deeper and uh, understand the controls in a, in a little more uh, detail than we're, we're going to be able to talk about today. Um, but these first five controls are considered the foundational cyber hygiene controls. And Jim had mentioned cyber hygiene. Um, it has been proven that, that if you implement these controls well, you could potentially present, prevent 80% of some of the breaches that we've seen. You know, and Jim had mentioned a couple of them. You know, so if we're, we're doing a good job of patching, we've identified all the devices on our network. You know, where we, we have a, the ability to look at our software and, and know which software we have deployed and what versions. You could actually boil these down into some pretty simple questions to make it even a little simpler. Um, so basic questions like, do we know what's connected to our systems and our networks? You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, from a Tanium perspective, we'll, we'll go into an organization, we'll ask them, how many endpoints do you have? You know, a lot of times we, we get a range. You know, I have between 15 and 18,000 machines, or I have between 45 and 50,000 machines. A lot of times folks just aren't sure, you know, how many machines you have in your environment. Uh, we really need to, to be able to go out, find those, be able to inventory those, and know exactly what you're on your, what's on your network because we can't defend what we don't know about. Um, do we know what software's running? You know, do you have the ability to, to get a full software inventory within your organization you know, with version, and, and how quickly can you do that? Right? Is, it, is that a huge effort? Is it going to take two months to be able to compile that data, or can you do that quickly? Are we, are we continuously managing our systems using known good configurations? As we know, you know, out of the box, you know, a lot of systems um, and, and software 
aren't configured in a secure way, right? And, th and there's some work that we need to do to identify, you know, what's the right way to configure something? Let's reduce some of these uh, vulnerabilities that we have, you know, just based on, on a system coming out of the box. And are we applying that to all our systems? And that kind of speaks back to, you know, the, the way that we've prioritized things. Again, if we're pushing out these configurations, if we don't even know about the devices, we're going to have no chance of doing that, right? So we've really got to focus top down as we work through these controls. Are we continuously working for and managing bad known software? So this is really about vulnerability management and patching. You know, are we identifying vulnerabilities? Uh, then are, are we actually solving them or, or do we just have a huge pile uh, and a, a huge report coming out of our vulnerability management system and we're not doing anything about them, right? And do we limit and track uh, the people that have admin privileges? You know, so this is a big one. You know, do, you know, you think about your domain admin accounts that are essentially, you know, God in your, in your MS uh, AD environment. You know, are we, are we limiting those accounts? Are we keeping a good tr uh, audit of, of how many accounts we have there? Are we tracking if new accounts are added? Are we sending alerts to uh, our security team? And do we have a handle on those? So to di dive in a little bit deeper on each one of the controls, let's start with CIS Critical Control 1. Uh, and really this is around a, a few things. You've got to start with some kind of discovery process. Um, it's really recommended that there's a, a couple of different approaches you could take. You know, one being an active method, so that you just think of Nmap we have on the screen here. There's a lot of tools that obviously that could do this, um, but that's actually going out, you know, taking a, a list of IP addresses, scanning, identifying them, interrogating them, understanding what's the host name of the system, you know, what ports may be open on it, you know, what operating system is it running. And then you could also include some passive techniques as well, and that's just taking some of the systems that we have uh, that are supporting our network today and taking what data they have about our endpoints and using that as well to try to identify things. So, you know, it could be, you know, just your switches themselves. You know, the ARP tables have a lot of good information about what's connecting to your network. You know, you could take your firewall logs, IDS, some, some IDS systems will actually help you do this as well and kind of build out an asset inventory just based on look, looking at the network traffic that's going through. Uh, and all this could also be sent over to a SIM solution. Um, another good source of information is DHCP server logging. Uh, as a system comes online, obviously it's going to, if it's configured for DHCP, it's going to ask for an IP address. But it also sends information about itself that identifies it, you know, things like the host name and MAC address that you could use uh, to build out you know, your, your discovery capability. And then one thing to keep in mind as we go through the controls that, that's very important is you got to think about how I can automate this. You know, it's one thing if I, you know, do a lot of manual effort, I collect all this data, um, but how do I make this repeatable? You know, so I could constantly keep this data up to date. I could constantly keep it fresh. And there's certainly a lot of commercial tools that could help you in that capacity. So once we have this data, um, really the next step is to build out our asset inventory. So you may leverage a, a CMDB solution that you already have in your organization. You know, figure out how to get that data that you've used in your discovery. And how do you get that into that asset inventory? Make sure that's up to date and fresh. Again, automation is, is key here. So, and once we have that, so now we have this asset inventory, it's up to date, it's fresh. You know, now we could start to consider maybe adding some additional controls, you know, things like network authentication. You, know, you could consider 802.1x, you know, there's a lot of NAC solutions you could leverage. Uh, we really recommend uh, certificate-based authentication, so you're identifying not only the user, but also the device. And that's a way to start to reduce those uh, machines that you don't want on your network, maybe it's a shadow IT problem. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, somebody bringing in their, their, their uh, Wi-Fi router and plugging it into your network, and we're going to reduce the opportunities for those to cause problems. So once we have uh, a good handle on our, our assets and, and we have that accurate asset inventory, really the next step is to consider control two, which is really looking at the software running on our endpoints. You know, do we have an inventory of, of software as well? Um, and really, it's very similar to control one. So do we have the ability to um, quickly take information from our endpoints, determine what software is running, and then also take that and then tie it into that inventory that we've already built? You know, so now you have a one-stop shop you could go to where I could look up an asset, understand exactly what software is on it, and maybe that's useful if you're doing uh, an engagement from an instant response standpoint. Maybe you want to know what's uh, on that system. You know, to have that accurate and up-to-date could be very helpful. Um, you can leverage tools that you already have in your environment. You know, a lot of folks are, are running SCCM from a management standpoint. Uh, so just you need to figure out a way, how, how do you mine that data? 
uh, make sure it's up to date and accurate and get that into your inventory. Again, automation you know, makes a lot of sense here. Um, and then once you have that, so now I have this list of all my applications, it's really about then from an organizational standpoint, understanding which ones are actually authorized, you know, which applications are really important to our business and which ones, you know, are going to cause risk or, or we just don't even need. All right, so it's really about building out that list of your authorized applications uh, to really move into potentially thinking about doing something like application whitelisting, which is really something that's going to make uh, your, your pen testers, you know, your attackers on your network uh, have, have a bad day, right? It's going to make things a lot harder. It's not perfect. There's, a, there's ways to get around it, um, but it's going to make things very difficult if you are able to implement this. Um, I really, you know, suggest a phased approach. So we, we see a lot of folks maybe start with blacklisting. Now we have this list of authorized applications. We know, you know, what shouldn't be authorized on our network. Maybe we start just blacklisting some of the applications that we don't want. Um, and, but the goal is to eventually get to a, a full whitelisting policy. Um, you can leverage tools, again, that you already own. Um, AppLocker you know, on, on most enterprise versions of the Windows clients is available. Uh, so certainly that's something you could use to build out a whitelisting policy. And I will point to this uh, NIST guideline. They have a really good write-up on, on how to implement whitelisting in your, in your network. Um, it's very detailed, and I definitely recommend uh, checking that out. So we talked about earlier, you know, the out-of-the-box configurations uh, may not be strong. You know, you may have devices with admin, admin uh, login credentials. We've all seen those in the past. Um, so how do we take care of that? And there's, there's plenty of benchmarks out uh, that you could leverage to understand what is a secured configuration for a device, right? And that could be uh, the CIS benchmarks are a great place to start. Uh, they actually package tools that you could leverage as well, syscat. Uh, Light is a free tool you could download. Uh, they have uh, commercial tools if, if you do join the CIS group that you can leverage as well. Uh, if you're in the federal space, STIGS is probably something that you're very well aware of. Um, but the idea is to take these, uh, customize it to my environment, figure out what makes sense for my, my company, uh, and enforce these on our endpoints, right? And there's lots of ways you could do that. You know, group policy uh, on the Unix or Linux side, you could consider Puppet and then MDM solutions for your, your mobile devices. And then once you have those out there, and maybe I've built secure images, I'm, I'm pretty confident I, you know, I've, I've hardened my, my systems in a, in a way that makes sense for my organization, you gotta make sure you have the ability to scan if changes occur, right? So we call that you know, deviations from those standards. Um, we have to have that ability to, to go out and check and make sure that those configurations that we decided on are still there, right? That an administrator hasn't you know, change those and reverse them to make his life easier, we gotta make sure we, we keep an eye on that and, and make sure that we're, we're checking those. And maybe even send alerts if we see deviations uh, back to our admins to take care of. So if you do those things now, you, you, pre, you have a pretty mature, um, uh, you have a pretty mature uh, capability here from a secure configuration standpoint. You can start to consider using file integrity monitoring tools. You know, just look for um, critical system files maybe that are being monitored outside of a, a normal change window. Um, so again, another way that you could potentially see, you know, if somebody's doing what they shouldn't be on, on their endpoints. So moving on to control four. Um, so the, again, this is about uh, both vulnerability management and patching. Again, uh, you need the ability to just do vulnerability scanning on your endpoints in general but you really need to focus on all systems. You know, a lot of, a lot of times uh, we focus on, we're just gonna scan our servers. You know, we don't have time for our endpoints. It's just too many of them. Uh, they're moving around too much. But we really gotta get to the place where we could scan our, all of our systems, right? We have this asset inventory. We've done a lot of work to build that up. You know, we need to make sure we have a complete picture when we do our vulnerability scanning. And again, the frequency recommended here by CS could be a real challenge as well. You know, are you doing that on a weekly basis or more frequent? A lot of organizations, you know, maybe get through maybe a quarterly scan just based on some of the network constraints that you have. So there's a couple pointers uh, you could look at as, you know, agent-based scanning could help. Uh, it doesn't solve all of your problems, um, but uh, when you th consider your, your endpoints as a, as a whole, your laptops, your desktops, uh, you're going to be able to get data a lot faster, uh, and you're not going to put as much of a strain on your network to get it back. Um, once you have this information, you want to start prioritizing by risk rating. You know, so Jim had the struts vulnerability up there. That was a CVSS10. You know, that's something that should be a high priority. 
uh, for your organization that you go out and uh, make sure that that's patched so you don't end up uh, in a situation where you get breached. And then you could start with open source tools. Uh, there's plenty of them available. Uh, but again, commercial tools are going to help you from an automation standpoint. You want to make this a repeatable process that you're continually doing. Once you've done that, um, the next uh, logical step is you, you need to actually patch things. You know, so I've seen a lot of times you have this huge report, you know, with all these vulnerabilities, um, but then it gets difficult, right? So you need to work with your ops teams. Make sure you know you're you're on the same page that you're actually patching those systems, not only the the operating systems but the applications themselves, which could be challenging. Um, one of the other issues we, we, we see regularly is, are your, is your patching software even working right? right? So maybe you're using SCCM. Is, is WMI corrupt on some of your systems? Are those patches actually getting out there? You need a way to validate and make sure that that software is actually working. Otherwise, it's not doing you any good. And then for those systems, we always have systems on our network that can't be patched for whatever reason. Right? So those we want to consider maybe doing some kind of network segmentation. Put them off to the side. Make sure they aren't a risk to the organization. And lastly, control five, this is really about controlled use of administrative privileges. Um, so really think about your, your, your highly privileged accounts. So the most common ones we, we see are domain admin accounts, your enterprise admin accounts. Uh, and make sure that you're auditing those groups regularly, that really only the people that really need that privilege have it. Um, and then you want to make sure if, if anyone's being added to that particular group that maybe you know about it, you send that to a list of uh, security folks or administrators within your organization. So everyone knows when there's any modifications to that particular group. And then you want to protect your accounts, right? So, so Microsoft has some, some really great uh, guidance. If you look at their Pass the Hash uh, white papers, I have a link to it down there. Um, they have two versions of it. Really gives you great information on how to you know, better structure your, your Active Directory environment to prevent credential theft. Um, so some of the highlights from that, you know, you want to consider maybe using dedicated administrative workstations. So anytime you log in with your your domain admin account on, on a particular system, if you do an interactive login, you're essentially storing a hash on that system. And that's something that could be stolen by attacker and then used to uh, infiltrate other systems, move laterally, and eventually get to your domain controllers, which a lot of times is the, is the goal. Uh, consider using a, a password vault. You know, so you know, that would allow you to, you know, take those accounts, store them in a, in a vault, and maybe you change those every day or you change those every week, and you add a multi-factor authentication on top of that. Again, making it more difficult for an attacker to get to those accounts that's going to give them access to, to everything in your network, you know, the keys to the kingdom. And then consider using log passwords as well. Okay, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jim, and he's going to talk about how we talk to the business. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we've, we've kind of laid out where some of the problems are. What we feel is a common sense approach to addressing many of those problems and those shortcomings. So, you know, the, the obvious next question is, um, how do we get the support that we need from the stakeholders and the decision makers in the business to be able to actually implement something like this? I think that there's probably a lot of accounts and uh, organizations that are out there that they know that they're deficient but they need to get the people who control the checkbook to actually write a check. Or in some cases, maybe it isn't writing a check. It, you know, the investment could be in priority. It could be in manpower, right? It could be that I don't have to do 15 other things for my job. I can focus on this. And so how do we talk to the business about making that business justification? And the important thing is we can't talk to the business the way we as techies talk to each other. Um, that's going to bounce off. That's not something that they understand. It's not something that they absorb. When you talk to the business and the stakeholders, what they understand is money, basically. All right. So everything really kind of ties back to a dollar amount. And so there's a lot of good tools that are out there. And researching this particular talk, uh, we found this particular study. The, the link is at the bottom there. And by the way, I should mention, anybody who wants these slides at the end um, will be available if you want to stop by the booth and get a business card and, and just shoot us an email. We'll be happy to send you the slides. But um, uh, down at the bottom there is the, uh, uh, there's a Ponemon breach calculator. And I really like this. This is actually very current. This came out this year. 
Um, the reason I like this is that you can plug in your industry segment, your geography, and there's a long list of other different criteria as it pertains to, you know, your business, your, your processes, uh, the different risk mitigation factors that you have in place or additional risk factors that you have in place or that you're facing. And then it spits out a number and it gives you a number that's defendable. It's a real number that you can use with uh, the business stakeholders to be able to go to them and essentially give them a price tag for doing nothing. Here's a price tag for doing nothing. We know that we have a problem. We have to make some investments, whether that be in manpower, whether that be purchasing some, uh, uh, some type of external tool, whether that be hiring additional people, you know, whatever it is, uh, whatever we see as being the way to address this, um, here's the cost of doing nothing. Uh, and I think this is a very powerful message. And, it, and it's a message that resonates with the business, right? And remembering that security is not the elimination of risk. It is the acceptance of risk. And, and there are acceptable risks. I drove here last night. The highway is one of the deadliest places in America. But I took the risk of getting in my car and driving up here because the payoff is worth it, right? We all do that all the time. We accept risk all the time. And sometimes this is an exercise in just explaining to the business, you know, how much risk are you willing to accept? And, and they may actually look at you and say, we're willing to accept that. At, at a minimum, at that point, then should that cri you know, crucial breach occur, uh, you've done your due diligence as a defender to explaining to the business that, you know, this is what you can expect should that occur. Um, the other thing that the business needs when you're talking to the business is metrics, right? So it's not enough to tell them we've got this huge problem and I need a lot of money or I need five more people on the team. Um, we have to actually give them metrics of where the problem is. And the other great thing about metrics is that once you've assembled them, it gives you a baseline to then show progress. Should we get the stakeholders to invest in this process and in this program, then we can now show progress towards uh, the goal. And so we can actually hold our own feet to the fire and in some cases, you know, toot our own horn and, and show, just uh, kind of prove to the business what a good job as defenders were doing, what their investment bought them. So, you know, so, so these are not by any means meant to be uh, a complete list of questions. But again, as Dan had mentioned, you know, how many unauthorized devices are on your network? How long does it take to detect those new devices if you can detect them at all? Uh, what percentage of the business systems uh, are missing critical patches? How long does it take for that to occur? And then being able to potentially trend that over time and provide that you know, um, uh, defendable hard data to the stakeholders as evidence of you know, this is your return on investment. And the other thing that we found that, that is very, very useful in talking to the business and getting buy-in from the, uh, the stakeholders is being able to show, particularly if it's an outside entity, you know, being able to quantify just the extent of the problem. And that's where certain professional services can come into play. Now, Tanium does not sell professional services. I told you this isn't a sales pitch and it's not. So we don't actually sell any professional services, so I'm not pitching any here. I can just tell you from my own experience in working with numerous shops over the years that this can be a very valuable tool for being able to build consensus within the business community of the organization. To be able to go to them and say, we've got this report. So remember I told you that it might be over $8 million if we get hit with a breach? Well, here's a report that's showing you exactly how easy that is for it to occur and the steps that they took to do it. Right. And and if you can't get the business to invest in those, one thing from my own experience that I've found, if there's a turnover in management, that that tends to be a good time to be able to request these sorts of things, because that new manager is going to want to know what it is that he or she is facing in terms of what they're going to have to work with. And this then gives them the, the tools that they need to go to the board or whoever to get the budget that they feel that they need. But even in situations where that's not possible, there are a lot of free tools and uh, resources that are out there. Uh, th the one that you see there on GitHub, this uh, awesome dash pen test, I really love that particular, um, that particular repository because it's got a lot of really good uh, um, 
capabilities and resources in one place. There's a lot of links. There's a lot of different links to different tools, different frameworks, different capabilities. The one there in particular, the penetration testing framework, I really is, is awesome if, uh, you know, particularly if it's something that you've never done before and you're new at. It actually has uh, this very voluminous list. It's an HTML document that lists out in detail um, all the different steps involved in performing a pen test, all the different tools that you would use. It even goes so far as to actually include the command line options. So if you've never used that tool before, it actually will tell you how to. So, you know, these resources are out there. So if you can't get the buy-in from the business, you know, everybody sitting in here, I assume, has a laptop. And so with a simple Google search and a couple of uh, tools that you can download, you actually could be able to compile that report uh, on your own. And the important thing, again, when talking to the business, beyond just talking in, in things that they understand, dollars and cents usually, uh, is to have a plan, right? It's not enough to go to them and say, you know, our, our processes suck, uh, we're, we're completely open to the next breach, and it's going to kill the company if that happens. But they don't want to hear that. What they want to hear is, I've got a plan to address it. And here's the, the cost of risk. We talked about using that calculator, the cost of doing nothing. And here's the cost of what it is that I'm asking for. Uh, whether it be, again, hiring new personnel, maybe investing in other technologies or processes that are lacking. Uh, and then the metrics for success. And when you can approach the stakeholders with this type of an ROI, giving them what the costs involved are, how we're going to measure success and and what our potential payoff is then this is the sort of this is the sort of business justification that gets very very difficult for people at the boardroom to deny it particularly when they see the type of high profile breaches that are happening on a pretty much daily basis because let's face it it's it's their neck that's in the news for the most part not ours uh, it's generally not the technical people that get 86 in those situations uh, but the executive level people are keenly aware of the fact that uh, if, if something like this hits, that they're going to have to answer for it. So if you are then the person coming to them with a solution, you're the hero. And that's exactly what hopefully um, everybody here has, has gotten some idea of some ways and, and, and to, to, to go about that. So that's pretty much what we had. Or, or, does anybody have any questions or anything that you guys would like to delve into? I know. Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, that's a tough situation. So for anybody who didn't hear the question, it was about balancing the immediate needs and, and you know, the fires that are burning right now, if I could paraphrase what's happening right now versus a long term. And I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Um, the only answer that I could say there is that, again, if you, during those moments when the fire is not burning hot, which hopefully there are some, you know, start to build some of this foundational work so that, you know, you can get that buy-in uh, so that hopefully you can get some assistance to, to, to help when the fires are burning. But I, but I do completely understand, you know, um, uh, we, I feel like a ping pong ball some days, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're standing between you guys and lunch, so thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it, and enjoy the con.